Slipknot recorded Volume 3 of the Subliminal Verses with producer Rick Rubin at the mansion in Los Angeles in 2003. There had been speculation regarding the possibility of a third album in the band's future, owing to members working on other musical projects. After the album was completed, the band said these side projects saved the band and helped them break out of the box they were in. Coming back together and working out their differences hindered the writing process initially. In 2008, jo drummer Joey Jordison said, We didn't talk to each other for three months. We just sat there wasting money in the fucking Houdini mansion. Percussionist Sean Cran stated, We eventually got sick of waiting for shit to happen. We got together, had a few beers, wrote a really artsy fucked up song called Happy Ending. In, 2003, and in a 2003 interview, Jordan explained that despite the initial problems, more than enough material was written for for the album and added that it's better to have so and added that it's better to have stuff to pick from than to settle for shit in contrast to have slip not settle too soon with fewer songs on previous albums band members were divided over their experience with working with producer Ruben. some doubted his commitment to slipknot as he split his time between many artists at once lead vocalist court taylor admitted in an interview that he drank heavily throughout their time in the mansion saying I would drink from the moment I got up until the moment I passed out. He explained that everything I did while drinking sounded like shit, while expressing how unhappy he was in the choice of vocal takes which ended up on the album. During this time, Percussionist Cran worked on vol Voluminal Inside of the Nine, a video documenting the creation process of the album and touring which would follow. 2008, Taylor said he met Ruben only four times during the entire recording of Volume 3 and that Ruben barely showed up to the studio. We were being charged horrendous amounts of money, and for me, if you're going to produce something, you're fucking there. I don't care who you are. He had, he's overrated, he's overpaid, and I will never work with him again. Conversely, guitarist Jim Root said in, that, said in that same interview, A lot of the guys in the band say Rick was unavailable, and yeah, he takes on a lot of projects at one time, but he also does things that are beneficial. He would listen to what we had done, then have us recheck things that needed work. He's kind of like Big Brother up on the hill. Even though he wasn't there physically every day, he was, and that's my favorite record we've done. Before the release of Volume 3, the band members had promised a more experimental album. Drummer Jordison said that it's almost as if Slayer were tapping on Radiohead. For the first time, it's Slipknot's greatest songs to just circle in Volume Vermilion Part 2 were led by an acoustic rather than an electric guitar. According to Todd Burns of stylists, songs such as Pulse of the Maggots and Before I Forget incorporate a pounding metal style. I music wrote that tracks such as The Blister Exists, 3 Nil, and Opium of the People combine the two extremes of the recognizable metal edge with melody and the most apparent shifts being in Taylor's vocal style, with relatively few songs relying solely on screen vocals in comparison to their earlier work. Slipknot Weekly wrote, or Entertainment Weekly wrote that the album bounced over between overpowering speed metal and haunting acoustic, acoustic rock. The reason I said Slipknot was because I looked down at my shirt for a second and it says Slipknot because it's a Slipknot shirt. Volume 3, The Subliminal Verses is Slipknot's first album that does not warrant a parental advisory label. Mainly because of the lyrics of Volume 3 compared to the other Slipknot albums are much less explicit in terms of profanity and obscure dark themes. The special edition still has a parental advisory label. I already knew that because I happen to own the two disc special edition instead of the original. And that is what we are listening to today in order to make this review. I've also got We Are Not Your Kind down here in the basin. I'm going to listen to that after recording this review. I'm just going to jam out to some Slipknot today. I'd actually bring down the rest of the Slipknot CDs I have and just play Slipknot, use like with, yeah, listen to Slipknot all day. Maybe not Iowa though, because I have my special edition of Iowa. I don't want to, in fact, I'm only listening to volume three because I want to, like I might not even listen to it. I might take it back upstairs because I don't want to use the double, like break the double disc one because it's really special to me. Um... In, 2008, in a 2008 interview, guitarist Mick Thompson explained that vocalist Corey Taylor made a point of avoiding the use of profanity in response to claims that he relied on use of it. Only two instances of profanity occur. The use of the word bitched and... There's three, actually. Bitched and duality, bastards in the monologue leading into Propulsive Maggots, as well as retarded on Welcome. According to AllMusic, the lyrics of Volume 3 of the subliminal verses include metaphors and touch on themes include anger, disaffection, and psychosis. Taylor's diversity in his vocal delivery was praised. Burns considered tracks like Vermilion Part 2 to have stately the vocal harmonies. Taylor's performance on the closing track, Danger Keep Away, was specifically praised. Silas on the, called it the most depressing and emotional track on the album. Burns concluded that overall, the riffs have lost another impact, but it seems like the group finally also wants to appreciate their vocal and lyrical impact. By early 2004, the album has finished work on it. 
and the band began the Subliminal vs. World Tour with their appearance on Jägermeister Music Tour in March 2004. Volume 3, The Subliminal vs. was released on May 24th, 2004. Be, what? I thought it was released in 2003. I'm pretty sure they got it wrong. Wikipedia, you done did me wrong. It peaked at number 2 on the Billboard album charts. The album produced 6 singles, Duality, Vermilion, Vermilion Part 2, Before I Forget, and The Nameless, and The Blister Exists. Slipknot recorded its first live album, 9.0 Live, while touring in support of the band's third album. Released on November 1st, 2005, 9.0 A, the first Slipknot thing that was released after I was born, was 9.0 Live. Peaked at number 17 on the Billboard album charts, touring in support of Volume 3 of the Subliminal Verses, continued through 2004 and up to the end of 2005 before Slipknot went on hiatus for the second time. In 2005, several members of Slipknot were involved in the Roadrunner United The All-Star Sessions, a collaborative album recorded by artists signed to Roadrunner Records for the label's 25th anniversary. 2006 saw Slipknot win their first Grammy Award, picking up the Best Metal Performance Award for their single Before I Forget. The single went on to be featured on the setlist of Guitar Hero 3 Legends of Rock. On December 5th, 2006, Slipknot released his third DVD, Voluminal Inside the Nine. While Slipknot went, was on hiatus, several members, ba several band members again focused their attention on side projects. Vocalist Taylor and guitarist Root returned to Sown Sour. Drummer Jordison toured with several bands and produced Three Inches of Blood's third album, uh, uh, Fire Off the Lades. And Cran found Dirty Li founded Dirty Little Rabbits, and Wilson returned on, as DJ Star Starscream once again. Now on Track One, Prelude 3.0. Prelude 3.0 is a legitimate song, unlike the other preludes. To be honest, it's second place in the preludes so far. It's the self-titled album Prelude being better in my track opinion. Track 2, The Blister Exists. The Blister Exists feels like just any other random screaming track that many people do over and over again. Track 4, Duality. The album version of Duality is 4 minutes and 12 seconds long. And the radio edited version is 3 minutes and 33 seconds long. So it's 333, three, three. haha, that's clever. The song opens with lead vocalist Corey Taylor softly saying, I push my fingers into my, leading up to lead guitarist Mick Thompson playing a riff accompanied by Craig Jones' keyboards, while Corey Taylor finishes his sentence with eyes and a much more intense voice. The song is played in drop B tuning, with, mo with which most of Slipknot's songs are tuned to. It features a new metal style. Unlike many previous Slipknot singles, Duality, like, Duality, like most of the songs on Volume 3, does not have prof profanity, other than the word bitched. Uh, Thomas Thompson explained in a 2008 interview that Lothus Taylor was relying on explicit content in the lyrics and wanted to try something different. This was echoed by Jim Thrute in a 2000, Root in a 2011 interview. All music said that Duality's listen lyrics aren't unique to Slipknot, but described it as an otherwise as otherwise strong. Stylus Magazine said that Duality had a hard grindcore riff. Q wrote that the song blows the competition away. Try Track 5, Opium of the People. More pointless noise. Look, I love Slipknot, but to be honest, in my head, I, a lot of their music feel, does feel like noise, and I can honestly understand where many metal haters get their opinions from. Track 6, Track circle, 7. In the Q&A for his book, You're Making Me Hate Me, Corey stated that the first verse of the chorus is a few times were recorded during the Iowa tour in 2001. The same take that ended up on the It's one of the more extreme words I think Slipknot has used, like when they used the term cocksucker and spit it out back on their self-titled debut. Track 9, Pulse of the Maggots. Corey Taylor said about the song, Volume 3 was really hard for me. I was in such a dark and depressing place, but about halfway through, I got my shit together. That's when I started the battle against my drinking and my crappy behavior. Pulse of the Maggots was the album we'd been miss uh, Anthony and we'd be missing. It only was originally called Trigger's Urine, but it was in a whole different direction with it. Then Joey said he'd got a name for the song, but no lyrics. From then on, it became, the song became more about the fans than it was about us. With how the fans would be a bunch of jerks from Iowa picking fights with each other in our basements. Track 10, Before I Forget. Before I Forget borrows elements from a much older Slipknot song, Carve, recorded before their self-titled album. The earliest version was in 1996 with Anders Kovensky on vocals. Carve was for the SR demo in 1997, it referred to fans as Crows. It's about standing your ground and deciding to be a good person no matter what people say, recalled singer Corey Taylor. Rick Rube Rube was convinced the chorus wouldn't work. I told him he was crazy. Lo and behold, it's one of our biggest songs, and we won a Grammy front for it. The last 18 seconds of the full-length song feature Morse code in the, in the left channel, spelling Slipknot, and Taylor muttering, you're wasting it, you're reversed. The songs featured in the video games Motorstorm, Rock Band 3, Guitar Hero 3 Legends of Rock, and Guitar Hero Live. Track 12, The Nameless. The Nameless is 4 minutes and 28 seconds long. 
the song begins with a high note of guitar riff with mixed in samples leading to the guitar notes getting lower and lead vocalist Corey Taylor starting with the lyrics with a scream. This eventually leads to low noted riffs with minor scales associated in. The song has a basic minor key riff around with, with thrash lyrics and interludes that are much softer. The chorus is slow, emotional, and epic. The song is in B minor like many other Slipknot songs. Now, I don't have anything for Virus of Life, Don't Get Close, or Scream, but all of them are good. Track 17, Danger, Keep Away, full length version I also don't have anything for, so I don't have anything for disc 2. So, track 18, which I messed with the track listing a bit, so that way I would feel better about it. So, Vermilion. When the band plays this, this song live, they switch from their ordinary masks to death masks, each an actual cast of the member's face. However, during the All Hope Has Gone tour, all members except Craig and Paul did not wear death masks for the song. That song was on a demo that Paul Gray and Joey Jordison put together. For some reason, I, as soon as I heard it, all I could see was the color red. I love the idea of creating a world from the standpoint of a stalker. I was trying to recreate that dark urgency and desperate need. Anyone who's ever had that jealous rage knows what that feeling is. I wrote most of this when the, then Paul put the middle section together. When I write, I'm always thinking of Corey's place in the song. The chemistry between me and Paul and Corey has been interesting, said Joey Jordison and Corey Taylor. Track 19, Vermilion Part 2. Vermilion Part 2 is a continuation of the story of Vermilion Part 1. It features two acoustic guitars, a cello, a piano, and Corey Taylor's baritone-styled vocals. The melody and overriding theme run through both versions, making them integral to each other. It features on the Slipknot DVD, Voliminal Inside the Nine, and it was performed by Taylor and Jim Root on radio station KISS FM. The cover for Part 2 consists of the Vermilion single cover with a red and yellow tint as opposed to the pink and gray tint of part one. A remix, Vermilion 2 Bloodstone Mix, appears on the Underworld Evolution soundtrack and a special edition of All Hope is Gone. The differences between two tracks are subtle. Vermilion part one is about interaction, the build up, the anticipation, and the neurosis, says Taylor. Part two is the aftermath, the pieces that have to be picked up, up to later, and maybe the guilt of having lived through it. Track 20, Vermilion Terry Day Mix, is... I don't really notice much of a difference. So yeah.